Uh, this week's Torah portion is the final portion in the book of Deuteronomy. Whew. <laughs> Seems like it's taken us a whole year to get through the Torah. And that means that in traditional Judaism and those who follow the annual cycle of Torah readings, they will start over again in Genesis next week. And there's actually a holiday uh, for this transition. This Sunday, after our picnic, we'll observe two holidays. One is biblical and one is traditional. The biblical holiday is the eighth day of Sukkot, mentioned in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 36, and it's called Hashemeni Atzeret. The Jewish people just call it Shemeni Atzeret. Uh, the eighth day assembly, uh, as it's called in Numbers 29, verse 35. At the same time, we will be observing the traditional holiday of Simchat Torah. Simchat means rejoicing uh, in the Torah because we read the final verses of Deuteronomy, and then we will have uh, the smaller version of the Torah scroll that we have in the fellowship area. We'll bring it in here, and uh, we will read uh, first the final verses of Deuteronomy, and then we'll rewind the, the scroll, and then we'll read some of the initial verses uh, in Genesis. Uh, also, uh, we will do a Torah march uh, with the larger Torah scroll around the congregation seven times. But before we can go through the celebration, we have to discuss the final portion uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. And it's kind of interesting because uh, to give you the setup, uh, the children of Israel uh, have been delivered out of slavery in Egypt, and then they uh, came to Sinai where they were blessed uh, with the, the Torah, the Lord providing uh, instruction, guidance. Um, and then... Uh, through some fault of their own, actually through a lot of fault of their own, uh, the journey to the promised land has taken a little bit longer than uh, it really should have uh, as they listen to the uh, evil report of the ten scouts. And, but now, nonetheless, they, they are poised to enter uh, the land of promise. And... Uh, right before they're getting ready to go in, two things happen. One, in last week's portion, the Lord told Moses to write a song. And when the Israelites heard the song, uh, they really didn't go out and buy a whole lot of copies for their friends and neighbors because the song predicts Israel's unfaithfulness, uh, the chastisement that the Jewish people would experience as a result. But we know that the situation is temporary. How do we know that? Well, we know, number one, the Lord has said he would not leave them nor forsake them. He says that over and over. He says it to Moses. Uh, in tonight's reading, he, he said it to Joshua. But secondarily, we also know that this chastisement is for the purposes, uh, as it always is, to draw the people back to the Lord. And as we often mention... If we read and we find a passage where the Jewish people are being uh, chastised, where their sins are being made known to them, uh, it, it may look kind of bad. The Lord is, it does not overlook sin, and he is quick to confront it and let it be known that he is not happy with it. But that is not a permanent state, because John will tell us all we have to do is what? Keep reading. Keep reading. Even at this, in this song, we find that one day the nations will rejoice for the Jewish people. One day the Lord will take vengeance on those who opposed his servants. One day he will make atonement for his land and his people. Now, there's also a, a more modern song based on one of the verses in tonight's portion. Anybody ever hear of the song, Zoraot Olam? Zoraot Olam? Any? No, okay. Um, in the English, that would be everlasting arms. Um, and can we lean on his everlasting arms? Amen. Well, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27 says the children of Israel can. Uh, as Rick read earlier, the God of old is a refuge with everlasting arms beneath, 
uh, supporting his people. Israel will live in security. Uh, Israel is a share, happy, because the Lord is their defender. He will cause their enemies to cringe before them, and the children of Israel will trample down their high places. And while these verses will likely see their ultimate fulfillment following Messiah's return, we're seeing some of this in our day. In 1948, the Lord restored the Jewish people to their land. In 1967, Jerusalem came back under Jewish control. And in 2018, the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem. We are seeing exciting things. It seems like uh, things are moving in the right direction, yet Zechariah 14 suggests that at some point in the future, all the nations will line up against the Jewish people, against Jerusalem. It will be on the verge, of it. they will be on the verge of being wiped out. And the Jewish people will turn to the Lord in desperation realizing that only the Lord can save them from those who are lined up and seek their destruction. Amen. Now, in this week's Torah portion, we're seeing a change in leadership, uh, kind of out with the old boss and in with the, the, same, uh, the new boss, who's the same boss, uh, because Moses is about to die and Joshua's about to take over. Uh, in last week's portion, Moses told Joshua in front of all the people, that the Lord will be with him. He will not fail him nor forsake him. This promotes a smooth leadership translation. Uh, let's try that again. A smooth leadership transition, uh, which, as you may be aware, is not always the case. Uh, the children of Israel do not launch an impeachment inquiry here, but there are times when our leadership transitions can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but that is not the case here. The final portion of Deuteronomy, I mentioned the song. It is followed by, uh, the portion is called Vizot Habracha, uh, which means, and this is the blessing. Uh, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses, like Jacob uh, earlier at the end of Genesis, is pronouncing his blessings over the children of Israel just prior to his death. And we all desire a blessing, don't we? We all desire words of encouragement. Uh, but here what we find are prophetic words being pronounced over each of the tribes of Israel. And instead of pointing to his own accomplishments, you know, Moses uh, is, knows that he is about to die. And yet his concern is not his legacy. He could easily have pointed to all the times he interceded on behalf of the children of Israel. But instead, he provides these words of prophecy uh, for each of the tribes. He starts out by pronouncing words of blessing that apply to the nation as a whole, describing in poetic language the Lord leading them in their journey, starting with giving them the Torah, preparing them for the culmination of their journey to dwell in the land of promise. And then Moses proceeds to bless each of the tribes individually. And interpreting these blessings uh, can be a bit challenging, and that's even with the benefit of, benefit of hindsight. We already know uh, some of these things have actually uh, taken place. We've seen uh, verses in the scriptures that uh, tell us more about uh, the experiences of the tribes and their fulfillment of uh, prophecy over them. Moses starts out saying of Reuven, the firstborn, he will live and not die out, but his men will be numbered in some way, according to Deuteronomy 33, verse 6. Uh, Stern even translates it as his numbers are few. That doesn't really sound like a double blessing for a firstborn. And Reuben has likely forfeited the firstborn, firstborn blessings because of an inappropriate relationship uh, described in Genesis 35, verse 22. Does God overlook his sin? It would appear that he does not. Next comes a blessing not to second-born Shimon, Simeon, or third-born Levi, Levi, but instead the next blessing goes to the fourth-born, Yehuda, Judah. You may remember that Simeon and Levi had been cursed by their father Jacob because of their violence and cruelty in an incident involving their sister, 
uh, Dinah's or Dinah's honor in Genesis 49 verses 5 through 7. Once again, the Lord does not overlook their sins. Now in our world today, some people think the rules don't apply to them. It often seems certain people are able to get away with things that the regular folks can't get away with. But as we've seen with Moses and the heads of the tribes of Israel, the Lord does not overlook sin no matter who you are. He never has and he never will. Amen. Yet many of our Jewish people and many believers for that matter act as though this is not the case. The rabbis of traditional Judaism uh, often uh, suggest that salvation is based on our good works outweighing our bad, downplaying the devastating effect of sin on our relationship with our creator, let alone the impact sin has uh, in our own lives in this world today. And I know of no scriptural support for the idea that a person can spend eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous God by having their good works outweigh their bad. Amen. Also, there are many who call themselves Christians today who will tell you you can live any way you want because of Yeshua's sacrifice, all is forgiven. Uh, you know, no matter what the sin, God... Um, the, the idea of God's grace uh, causes us to not have to be concerned with that. But nowhere in the Bible does it suggest that we can live any way we want and call ourselves followers of Messiah. In the New Covenant, in Romans chapter 6, verse 15, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, asked, Therefore, what conclusion should we reach? And then he goes on and he suggests something that from what he has said before, you might think this is what he is saying. Let's go on sinning because we're not under the law, but under grace. And Paul answers in the strongest negative. In the Greek, it is meganoito. You know, Stern's translating it as heaven forbid. Uh, that is not uh, what Paul would have us to understand from the role of uh, grace in regards to um, the grace that we experience as new covenant believers. Our grace is that our sins can be forgiven, not that we continue uh, to practice them. Amen. At the end of tonight's portion, Moses is told one time, one seemingly small indiscretion when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it, because of that, he will not be able to enter the land of promise. God does not overlook sin. He has a standard of righteousness that while we are unable to fulfill it, he provided the way that we can be seen as righteous. He provided his son as the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for our sins. Our good works cannot be good enough to satisfy his standard of righteousness. It had to be just like the, the sacrificial system that we find in the book of Leviticus. The, the sacrifice had to be without spot or blemish. Uh, and that is why we needed Messiah Yeshua, who was able and kept Torah perfectly, who was without spot or blemish, who did not sin, uh, who was without sin. Because um, 1 John 3, 4 uh, um, uh, translates sin or, or tells us, defines sin as transgression of the Torah. So for Messiah to be without sin, that means he could never transgress the Torah. And um, we find through the Torah that we are unable to meet God's standard of righteousness, but we also find the grace of God by providing his son uh, as the sacrifice in our place. The sin is not overlooked. The punishment has to be paid. But Messiah Yeshua stepped in and took the punishment for us. Back to the blessings. Jacob has already said of Judah in Genesis 49, verse 10, that the scepter shall not depart until uh, Shiloh or Shiloh comes. And uh, it's generally understood that Shiloh is a term for the Messiah, meaning the Messiah would come through Judah's line, uh, which we see fulfilled in the New Covenant scriptures regarding Messiah Yeshua in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 1 with the genealogy and also in Luke 3, uh, genealogies that... Um, 
lead to Yeshua uh, go back to uh, his ancestry uh, as part of the tribe of Judah. Here Moses blesses Judah in Deuteronomy 33 verse 7 saying, Hear Adonai the cry of Judah. Bring him into his people. Let his own hands defend him, but you help him against his enemies. While the tribe of Judah was always positioned at the front whenever the nation would go into battle based on the Lord's instructions in the book of Numbers, the blessing seems to be about the Lord as being the one who provides the victory through the tribe of Judah over Israel's enemies. Levi is blessed next because according to Deuteronomy 33 verse 9, the Levites were more devoted to the Lord and his covenant than even to their closest family. And um, we know from a, a, an event that took place that the Levites had become the Kohanim, the priests, uh, the, the intercessors between God and the people after the golden calf incident. Uh, originally, the people were going to be able to go directly to God. In Exodus 19, verse 6, the Lord tells Moses to say to the people, you will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. But after the golden calf incident, it was only the Levites who would serve as priests. Part of the blessing of the fulfillment of the Brit Kadeshah, of the new covenant, according to 1 Peter 2, verse 9, is that once again, all of God's people will be kings, uh, will be the king's priests. They will be able to boldly approach the throne of grace, as it says in Hebrews 4, verse 16, because of the atoning sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Our blessings are not tied to our goodness any more than Israel's blessings were tied to their faithfulness. We find out that though Israel may be unfaithful, Though we all have our moments when we fall short, God remains faithful. Amen. He remains faithful to the promises because of the faith of our forefathers, because he needs to demonstrate to this world who he is by the people that he has chosen for his purposes, the Jewish people, as a demonstration to all the world of his faithfulness, a demonstration to all the world of how he blesses people who are faithful in serving him. And also they turn out, not that they want to be, a demonstration of God's chastisement when they go astray. Similarly for us, the Lord chastises those he loves. Yes. Do we really want him when we go astray to just say, oh, okay, one down, I got a bunch more here that I can uh, deal with? Or do we want him to say, no, Todd, turn around. You're going the wrong direction. You need to come back towards me. You need to make teshuvah. You, you need to reevaluate against the standard that I have established in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writings, in the new covenant scriptures, and see whether or not your life is lining up with those principles, with my instructions, or are you going your own way? Do you have your own agenda? Are, are you listening to the flesh that only seeks after pleasure uh, and is only concerned with preventing ourselves from being hurt, uh, it, it is basically selfish to the core? Or is there a new way? Are we a new creation? Are we able to be selfless? Are we able to be led by the Spirit? Are we able to count others as better than ourselves? Are we able to say, I must decrease so that he would increase? It's a completely different approach. And as we understand his unconditional love for us, we will want to display it back towards him. And he would even have us practice by displaying it towards others. Do they deserve it? No way, Jose, to use an expression we had when I was growing up. Uh, me ganoito, okay? They do not deserve it, but we didn't either. And so as we display unconditional love towards others, we have a greater understanding of God's willingness to display his unconditional love towards us, to allow his only son to be the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for our sins, to die though he had done nothing wrong. And so uh, we, we experience these blessings, and, and, and that is why blessings are, are so important. Um, and and uh, one day, 
These, these things will be restored to the way they once were. And, and yet uh, God will continue to bless according to what Moses has uh, said regarding the different tribes. The next blessings go to the tribes of Benjamin and Joseph. Excuse me, Jacob's two sons by Rachel, Rachel. Benjamin is described as living in security and protected by the Lord. Joseph is blessed with the best of the land and great numbers for his son Ephraim. Some translations say myriads, which means thousands and thousands. Sometimes it can even mean millions. Uh, and then it says thousands for his son uh, Manasseh. As once again, uh, we see the Lord giving the younger uh, the greater blessing and the older the inferior blessing, a sign that God is not bound um, by earthly uh, birth order or any other earthly uh, laws that exist in this universe. When we ask him to perform a miracle, when we go to him in prayer, we are asking him to change the natural order because he is able to. Whatever we might pray for, we are praying, Lord, you are able to search or supernaturally overcome the limitations of this world. And so we are not bound by this world, even the ultimate weapon of this world, which is death. Okay, These earthly bodies are going to give out one day should the Messiah tarry. But nonetheless, he tells us he is the demonstration in his resurrection that death has been overcome. It no longer has the victory. It no longer has the sting. And, and I've spoken to many believers in their very last days in this world, uh, in their fleshly bodies. And, and there is a peace, a peace that passes all understanding as they realize that this world is not all there is. That, that death is just merely going to be a transition to the rest of eternity in God's presence. Our flesh uh, is scared of death. Our flesh wants no part of it. We have all sorts of euphemisms, uh, words that we use uh, to say, you know, the person has passed on. They've gone to be home with the Lord. All sorts of ways that we try and, and um, deal with our uh, struggles with the idea that one day this fleshly body will no longer be able to um, live in this world to, to uh, house life and yet our spirits are eternal and, and not only that the Lord will one day we don't know exactly how but even as we heard in the, this week's new covenant portion with the idea that uh, all of a sudden they saw Yeshua's body transformed into this glorified body we too will one day experience that according to the scriptures uh, our spirits will be reunited with our bodies but they will be glorified bodies that will no longer experience suffering and pain. And, and that gives us a hope, a hope that this world doesn't have. This world looks around and sees suffering. And the only question they can ask is why? It, it, they have no answer for it. But we, on the other hand, see suffering as a blessing because we can share in the suffering of our Messiah. We can go through, uh, we can have experiences in our lives that will enable us to be a blessing to others who are going through something similar. We can offer words of encouragement that we have uh, come through the battle victorious in some cases. In other cases, we say, look, I may not get the victory in this area, but the Lord is with me even in the midst of the battle. And, and so suffering can be a blessing. We can learn truths that on the mountaintop, we, we don't, we're not aware of those twos. We're, ju we're just celebrating and we just feel like you know, we're just sitting there under the glory spout, taking it all in. But, but God took the Jewish, the children of Israel out into the wilderness, into a place that was a harsh environment where there was no PlayStation. There was no internet. They, they, it was just them and the Lord, okay? Even way back then, you know, there were times without the internet. I know it's hard to believe and imagine today, but the reality is that sometimes God has to take us away from all of that. Uh, on a weekly basis, he has provided the Shabbat where we should be focusing on that which is eternal, where we take a pause from our day-to-day -day existence and everything that consumes our time to say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to understand today? 
that I might understand just by setting this day apart for you, just by listening for your still small voice to reveal the truth that I can't hear when there's all this other noise going on. And so we want uh, to be faithful to his calling in our lives, even when it's a calling to do things that we would rather not do that may even involve suffering. Uh, we are called to be selfless. Uh, and, and, and we are able to see blessings uh, in suffering when the world sees uh, nothing but something to be avoided at all costs. Sometimes, you know, the battle will require suffering. Yeah. You know, you can't win the battle if everybody runs away as soon as somebody gets injured or killed. You, you've got to continue the fight. Yeah. But we know that the Lord is on our side. We've read the end of the book. We know who wins in the end. And so we see things from an eternal perspective. And, and we no longer fear if we lose our lives as long as we feel like, okay, Lord, we, this has happened in service to you. Or I've lived a good life. You've given me so many blessings in this world. And I know they're going to pale in comparison to what awaits. When you look at our time in this world, it's a snap of a finger, a blink of an eye uh, compared to the rest of eternity. And yet the Lord wants intimate fellowship with us in this world to prepare us because we are going to have fellowship with him for all of eternity. We are going to spend all of our time along with the seraphim saying, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We, we just are here in a time of rehearsal. That's one of the things that the appointed times accomplishes for us. We rehearse. Sometimes we don't even know when the performance is to take place, but we continue to rehearse so that we might be ready. Moses uh, continues the blessing, blessing the rest of the sons of Jacob, the ones that we hardly ever talk about. And just before he pronounces the blessing over the entire nation, once again, that we read earlier, his final blessing is over Asher. Uh, the, the um, last of the sons and, uh, by Leah. And the uh, Asher, mean, as we said earlier, means happy. And the final blessing that he gives over the nation is Ashrecha Yisrael mi chamocha, which means happy are you, Israel. Who is like you? They are to be... Uh, above all the nations for the purpose of demonstrating that their God is greater than any other God. And we have the privilege of not only serving that God, but knowing that God and experiencing his love for us. Amen. We should not take that for granted. That's why we need it one day a week, plus these appointed times, to reflect on all that he has done, including Sukkot, the Feast of Booths, as we reflect on his provision. Uh, when he made the children of Israel dwell in booths in the wilderness. The blessing over the entire nation, once again, the Lord will help them. They will live in security. Uh, happiness is yours, Israel. Uh, who is like you? You've been saved by the Lord. He will subdue your enemies. You will trample down their high places. The high ground was often a place that was used to worship uh, a god, whether it's the god of Israel or, or the pagan gods. And um, before Yeshua selected the 12, he went up on a mountain and prayed all night. After the feeding of the 5,000, Yeshua sent the people away and went up on a mountain to pray. And where did he go after his final Passover Seder? The Mount of Olives. And our new covenant portion started with Yeshua talking to Peter, James, and John, who had gone up on a mountain to pray. The mountain is a place of solitude and a place of worshiping the Lord. And that helps us to understand why there's a battle going on today over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Second, you know, the, the uh, instructions were to go up to the Temple of the Lord. It was the high place in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And uh, Second Chronicles 3 verse 1 tells us that Solomon's temple was built on Mount Moriah, a threshing floor that David subsequently uh, purchased uh, from uh, Arab, or, or that David had purchased from Aravna, the Jebusite, paying 50 shekels, according to 2 Samuel 24, verse 4, for the threshing floor and some oxen. And yet the Palestinians today are trying to convince the world 
that the Temple Mount never belonged to the Jewish people and there never was a temple at that location. And while King David purchased the land, the Jewish people would soon lose control over it until, as I said earlier, they regained control of the Temple Mount in the Six-Day War of 1967. But then, because in their Declaration of Independence, it says Israel will always protect and grant access to the holy sites of all religions, something that they have not experienced in return, uh, Israel decided to put the Temple Mount under international control. And since the Arabs have existing structures on the Temple Mount and the Jewish people currently do not, the Arabs see the Temple Mount as belonging to them and not the Jewish people. The Torah portion concludes in chapter 34 with the death of Moses at the age of 120. So he's described as having eyes that are undimmed and vigor that is undiminished. That's to help us to see that God chose Joshua to replace him, not because uh, he couldn't lead anymore, um, but there's two reasons. One is, as we've stated over and over, the Lord does not overlook sin, particularly in the case of a leader. And also, if Moses had led the children of Israel into the promised land, the people would have been worshiping Moses for having uh, accomplished that. Whereas here we find out that it is the Lord who has accomplished it. It is the Lord who raises up the leader. Whether it's Moses, whether it's Joshua, as long as the Lord is on their side, the people are able to cross over the, whatever size river there might be uh, and enter into the land of promise. The people mourn Moses' death for a period of 30 days. And this is incorporated into the Jewish approach to mourning following the death of a close family member. There's an intense seven-day mourning period called sitting Shiva, based in part on the time of Job's friends comforting him in Job 2, verse 13. And that's part of a uh, larger time of mourning, the 30-day time of mourning called Shaloshim, which means 30, based on the mourning period we find here for Moses. The traditional Haftarah that uh, accompanies this Torah portion is Joshua chapter 1, uh, where Joshua has now taken over leadership of the nation following the death of Moses. And in Joshua 1 verse 5, the Lord assures Joshua, no one will be able to withstand you as long as you live. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will neither fail you nor abandon you. And in Joshua 1 verse 17, the people publicly acknowledge his leadership saying, just as we listen to everything Moses said, so we will listen to you. The Lord was faithful to Joshua and the Israelites in their conquest of Canaan, just as he continues to be faithful to all of the co covenant promises he's, he has made to our people, culminating in the ultimate blessing through the Brit Kadeshah, the final covenant renewal, the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. This covenant was to be different than the covenant made with the children of Israel and with through Moses, in that the Lord says he will not just give them the, the instructions, but that he will write his Torah on their hearts. And he will be their God, and they will be his people, and he will remember their sin no more. And in the new covenant portion that we read earlier, Peter, James, and John are on a mountain with Yeshua in Matthew 17. Suddenly, as I explained, he's transfigured. His face shines like the sun. His clothes become bright white. And then two people appear, Moses and Eliyahu, Elijah, representing the Torah and the prophets. Uh, and if we think about it, in Matthew 5, 17, that's exactly what Yeshua said. He came not to abolish, but to complete or fulfill. And that not the smallest stroke or letter would pass away until all is fulfilled in Matthew 5, 18. And if we think about it, you know, it's kind of like, how could Moses, the one who had led them in so many ways, never get a chance to enter the promised land? But here we see that it wasn't that he would never enter the land, it just would not be in the timing that he might have hoped for. As now, he is finally in the land. Our blessings are not limited God does not see us only in terms of our life in the Olam Hazel, only in this world. But there is an Olam Haba, there is a world to come. And in the world to come, Moses uh, experiences the blessing of being able to uh, come into the land. Through Messiah Yeshua, we are able 
to spend the rest of eternity in the presence of a holy and righteous God. Let us just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we have observed this time of dwelling that you have established, uh, this time of dwelling in the sukkah, in the booth, we thank you that your spirit dwells in our midst today. And we thank you for these special times that you have established, your appointed times, that we might better understand your faithfulness to your people. And Lord, we know that you have revealed that the only way anyone can be restored in their relationship with you, a relationship that has been broken down by sin that you do not overlook and you do not ignore, is through the sacrifice that your son Yeshua provided on their behalf. So if you're here tonight, you've never accepted Yeshua before, but you want to accept him as your Messiah tonight, all you have to do is raise your hand and you can put it right back down. We always give this opportunity. We never take for granted that everybody's already made this uh, willingness to acknowledge Yeshua's sacrifice as their own one. For those of us who are believers, already followers of the Messiah, uh, as we observe this time of dwelling in the sukkah, as we uh, take time to acknowledge all of the blessings that the Lord has provided uh, to us, many that we may tend to take for granted, Lord, we ask that your glory would rise and shine forth over us, that you would watch over, protect, and provide for us, that you would help us to purify our hearts, uh, as we seek your dwelling presence in our midst at this time and in this day. And we ask you to help us to be a blessing to others, to share your love, your unconditional love with those who desperately need it, particularly the world who cannot understand that type of love. Help us to serve you in all that we do as we celebrate uh, this time of rejoicing, as we thank you for giving us the Torah, for providing instruction and guidance for our lives, as we thank you for dwelling with us, as we seek to purify our temple, to be holy ones because you are holy, that we might bring glory to you in all that we do. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon all who are here, upon our congregation, upon all those who are not able to be with us, who need a touch from you this night, and upon all Israel as you demonstrate your faithfulness. We humbly ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you all.